Hello, I'm David Gergen, speaking to you from the campus of Harvard University. Uh, today, we're uh, on behalf of the Kennedy School and our Center for Public Leadership there. Uh, we're honored to uh, welcome two distinguished guests uh, here to the university campus to have a conversation this morning. Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wu Dunn are the first married couple to win Pulitzer Prizes, each one winning a uh, Pulitzer Prize in their work in China some years ago. Uh, between them, they have three Pulitzer Prizes altogether. Uh, they have three wonderful children, uh, and they have four best-selling books. Uh, more than that, they become known as voices of conscience among the best and most important in the world, and most certainly and most influential here in the United States. And we'd like to talk to them about the state of leadership, where this, where the world seems to be going, what kind of leaders uh, they admire. Uh, and why do some leaders we admire seem to de self derail, self destruct? Um, so, welcome to each one of you. Uh, and then let's let's first sort of set a context. Where are we as a world between World War One and World War Two? As you all know so well, the numbers in demo of democracies in the world actually declined quite sharply. So, it is possible to go backwards. Uh, are we going backwards as a world today, or or, or is it a mixed picture? Well, I like to think of the world going in cycles. Mm -hmm. And so we're in a, you know, <coughs> in terms of democracy, we're in a down cycle, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that it actually also can, can uh, recover, which I think it definitely can. But uh, two of the largest, the world's largest economies, the U.S. And, and China, are seeing a little bit of a setback. And in particular, China is extremely noteworthy because it is now uh, as um, powerful as it has ever been in our lifetimes. And uh, we have a leader, Xi Jinping, who has been elevated to near status uh, that Mao, Mao Zedong, uh, Chairman Mao, had. Uh, he has been written into the Constitution, his name and his thought. And if you think that, yes, Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping were also written into the Constitution, uh, Mao Zedong was written into the Constitution 24 years after he was in power. Mm -hmm. Deng Xiaoping was written into the Constitution after he died. Xi Jinping was written into the Constitution five years after he was in power. So this man is clearly on a very fast trajectory, and he has ideas of his own. And it's, there's a good chance Vladimir Putin could be in power for another decade or more. Uh, are the, if you look at the arc of Xi and, and Putin, is that good news or bad news for the world? Yeah, I, I think that it depends on Xi himself. Uh, right now, it looks as though it's, um, you know, he has said in the past that Putin is, he really looks up to Putin. Right. So we could be headed for some dangerous territory. But, you know, he could also maybe have um, an enlightenment of his own. He could. Have you seen it very often? <laughs> <laughs> no, not so far. Uh, Nick, how do you see the world, the state of democracy in particular? So, I mean, I think there is no doubt that we've seen uh, retrogression uh, in recent years in the Middle East, obviously. Um, uh, in Latin America, really just in a couple of countries, Venezuela, for example, for a time in Ecuador. Um, but then especially among, you know, the big players among Russia uh, and China. And here in the U.S., we have this authoritarian tinge as well. But I must say I'm... A little more optimistic, maybe because I spent so much of my career covering democratic progress and mm -hmm. watching Eastern Europe uh, mm -hmm. become uh, democratic in Asia, covering Mongolia, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, mm -hmm. Thailand, all uh, Philippines becoming more democratic. And I do think that there are larger forces and that when people become more educated and when people become, there's more of a middle class, that they do want more of a voice. And mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, we, Putin was able to ride a lot of economic uh, difficulties to power mm -hmm. and then he benefited from oil and, and uh, now that is going the other way. I think it may be harder for Putin to stay around indefinitely. Xi Jinping, I don't know, I wouldn't bet on the timing, but mm -hmm. I think that the same forces that ousted uh, uh, authoritarian rulers in all the surrounding countries are eventually going to lead to more democratic voices mm -hmm. and decision-making uh, in China itself. You visit over 150 countries. 
And in many of those, if you go back, look South Korea. That's a good example of what you're saying. It's a country that has become much more democratic, has been prosperous. It has some, it has some is- issues and some challenges, no doubt. But there are other countries like that. I su- assume you're talking about Japan and Germany and others. It, and that you see them as the, uh, you see them as the more dominant force. With, and are we then going through something of a counter-revolution? The last gasp of people who are trying to stop globalization, who are trying to. St- Stop the push toward uh, you know uh, uh, new technologies. You know, I um, I'm tempted to use the term last gasp, but I don't <laughs> think it's quite last, yeah. and I think it's more than a gasp. Uh-huh. But it is obviously a, a real backlash, and yeah. I think that uh, the capacity to either deliver economically or mm-hmm. to promise on economic uh, uh, gains leads people to be tempted toward authoritarian rulers sometimes. Likewise, I think uh, targeting uh, minorities leads people to ride to power periodically. But, you know, if you look around the world, uh, there has been this larger trend that this seems an exception to. And even in Europe, as you mentioned, you know, Greece, Spain, were uh, authoritarian countries, and these larger forces of globalization, of a rising middle class, of greater education, tended to propel them toward more pluralistic societies. Uh, you know, the same was true of Eastern European countries, uh, uh, of these various Asian countries. I don't think that Russia is immune to that. I don't think that hmm. China is immune to it. And what we may see is something more like Mexico or Taiwan, where you had a ruling party that uh, still remains dominant but gradually becomes somewhat Mm -hmm. less tyrannical, somewhat less brutal, and makes a little bit more space for Mm -hmm. alternative voices. And I can imagine that kind of evolution happening in China as well. Hmm. Although at this point, I think it's very hard to see how that would happen in China in the near term, uh, partly because now she not only has the titular uh, you know, status. Mm-hmm. But um, from what we hear, the, the Chinese people that we're talking to, there is no one who is opposing him and mm. is willing to oppose him. Uh, that is that because they're afraid or because they think he's, he, he's actually leading somewhere in a, in a positive well, direction? I think part of it is fear mm-hmm. uh, and because he has been very good, very successful at getting rid of all of his potential threats and right. his enemies. And he has just such a hold on power that no one is willing to dare uh, mm-hmm. you know, to, to counter him. But the only uh, path that I see that might actually uh, force him or nudge him uh, to be a little bit more open-minded is that if the economy, if he cannot deliver on the economy, because, you know, in the past 10 years, China has had phenomenal growth, or average 10 percent. Now it's more down to 6, 7 percent. If he cannot deliver that, and, right. you know, then you've got um, a, a bubbling populist, populace they're not going to rise, so to speak, in the way we think yeah, of it here. But he is investing in the future heavily. He is investing in the future. So the question is whether yeah. he can deliver on that economy. Mm-hmm. Is he now the is he now the most powerful leader in the world? You know, I think that if you look at what China is trying to do with the One Belt, One Road, the right. Belt and Road Initiative, that is potentially, it is mind-blowing what they are trying to do. A trillion dollars, by some accounts, $5 trillion, pouring into basically, uh, you know, creating uh, China, making China once again the center of the world and creating pathways that will stretch halfway around the world. It is an incredible, uh, uh, you know, a plan. And they they may not get all of it, but even if they got half of it, that is going to be an incredible um, power grab for China. And they will have countries that are going to be at their beck and call, basically. Hmm. One thing I'd say, though, is that um, authoritarian leaders uh, look permanent until the moment that they're not. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we have, I mean, we, you know, we covered uh, Indonesia, and Suharto was going to be there forever until the moment he fell. Uh, Mao, in the late 1950s, one would never imagine that in a few years he'd effectively be sidelined. Uh, then a few years later, one would never have imagined the Cultural Revolution, which was his great effort to come back. Um, in uh, 19, in the summer of 1978, nobody would have imagined that Deng Xiaoping would completely emerge and, and turn China around. Um, so um, I do think that 
one of the problems that authoritarian leaders face is that their rule is intensely personal and that they don't institutionalize, or sometimes they try, but they tend to have difficulty institutionalizing their uh, rule. And I think that does create real vulnerabilities. And um, so there's one reason I'm optimistic, uh, but I'd be, I, I wouldn't want to place a bet on the timing of <laughs> the changes. <laughs> so tell me about uh, democratic leaders. Uh, which ones in the world do you most admire now? Um, you know, I, I think um, I think Canada is a fascinating example because all around the world we're seeing uh, backlash to immigration uh, right now. We're um, I think Angela Merkel really tried to do something important by inviting in Syrian refugees. There's huge backlash that forced her back to some degree, and. Uh, the, maybe the biggest exception to that has been Canada. And Canada, historically, was every bit as xenophobic as the U.S. Hmm. Uh, and one saw that in the, you know, through the, about the middle 1950s. And then around the late 50s and then early 60s, it began to change. And then under Pierre Trudeau, uh, Justin's father, he really used his political capital as a leader to argue that we Canadians have to rely on immigration. This is going to be a strength of our country. And I think that Justin has inherited that willingness to use his political capital to not just run in front of people and keep on going the same direction, but actually to try to make arguments that resonate. And so when he showed up at the airport and welcomed Syrian refugees by handing out jackets and said, you know, this, we are asserting our Canadianness mm -hmm. by welcoming people. This is something we should take pride in. Mm -hmm. I mean, remarkably, Canadians then did kind of feel a sense yeah. of pride. And I think that <clears throat> is very commendable when leaders manage to, to actually exercise that kind of real leadership on not just a pragmatic level, mm -hmm. but also on a, on a moral or ethical plane. Yeah, but I think it's yeah. also pragmatic, too. I mean, if you look at Canada, it's a tiny populous country. I right. mean, they have a vast amount of land, but they need people. So it's in their own self-interest to also right. open their, their gates and get the smart immigrants and grab them before the U.S. grabs them. So I think it's being very pragmatic as well. And it just so happens that it does, you know, align with the moral leadership that Justin is really sort of taking the, right. the but, banner but up. But he goes beyond that uh, in, the, in the, the empowerment of women. His, his cabinet is half women. Yes. And I'm, I'm told he will no longer go on a panel uh, that is not balanced by gender. Yeah, no, I think that that is phenomenal. That is great. He, I think it's the yeah. most, I, I yeah. saw a poll that was the single most popular thing he's done. Oh, interesting. Okay. It was, I wish I was encouraged yeah. about yeah, Okay, well, he also knows what to, how, to, how to please <laughs> please the populace, right? He raises half the sky, you know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, you all have thought about this a lot. Exactly. I mean, is there any other country which is, well, there are some, I guess, yes. some Scandinavian countries. Scandinavian countries, yes, yes, so, yes. yeah. Uh, and out of practicality, a, yeah. Rwanda, yeah. too. And, Sweden yeah. has a feminist foreign yeah. policy, uh, and... Um, a feminist foreign policy. Feminist foreign policy, as, yeah. as Canada does. So yeah. the idea is that you look at your foreign policy right. and look at the, at the consequences of steps you take to look at the impact on women mm -hmm. in different places, when, that you consciously examine, use that lens, uh, use that prism to look at, at behaviors and, and actions. They're calling it gender budgeting. And so uh -huh. you even have elements of it in other countries. So for instance, South Korea. Right. Uh, they used to, when they were looking at... Um, the number of women who who used to have to make a choice. Uh, they could have kids and pull out of the workforce, right. or they could work and not have kids. And so then they realized that actually if they created a better social care and, mm -hmm. and child care policy, that they can allow women to, uh, you know, have kids and work at the same mm -hmm. time. And so it freed up. So it's, it's an element of gender budgeting in the South Korean, uh, you know, country, which is still also quite yeah. Um, has has pro pro yeah. pressures against women. I, I I I believe you could one can make the argument that Canada is one of the best governed democracies in the world now. I, I'm I'm not sure. But I I wouldn't want to go too far with that. But they they came through the Great Recession much more successfully well. though because they were it was a sensibly run system. That's right. Yeah. And they've dealt. I mean, they have obviously a similar tradition to the U.S. on yeah. uh, guns, for example. From my point of view, they regulate guns much more successfully than we do. Mm -hmm. um, social policy on health care, their national health policy is fairly relatively new, um, you know, as health plans go, but it 
likewise, I think, has been pretty successful. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they obviously have problems, including the native issue, which is remains a burning source right. of inequity. But mm -hmm. I think they genuinely try to confront it. Yeah, but I think they've been hit hard by the commodities because so much of their econ economy is the commodities. And, you know, I, I do think that um, they have done very well because even though they are a small economy, like Australia, like Taiwan, and I, I do believe that it is, and Singapore, it's, it's easier to manage smaller mm -hmm. economies. Uh, they still have done it very well. They've sort of, you know, approached their potential more uh, right. than other countries right. have. Do you all see uh, uh, a new generation of leaders essentially emerging, some of whom are very promising, some of whom are not? Uh, are you encouraged about that, Nick, you, you're in, your, in your voyage of optimism? Yeah, yeah. You know, my, my optimism, may, it may just be that I have a lot of serotonin running around <laughs> rather than based on an actual, uh, you know, actual things. That, but, but, for example, in this country, um, I, uh, on, so there's some issues where polling suggests there isn't a big generation gap. Abortion is the classic where young people and older people, there's not a huge difference. But on so many of these really divisive uh uh, cultural battles, attitudes towards gays are mm -hmm. the most important. There's a huge generational gap. Attitudes towards women's rights, uh, just a vast gap. Um, and young men are more feminist than older women. Mm -hmm. um, and, That's interesting. And so I do uh, think that on a lot of these sort of fundamental issues of equity, it's, it's really kind of promising the direction that we're going in. And I think that, you know, I think that one of the mistakes that my generation, I'm a baby boomer, mm -hmm. we, uh, I think one of the mistakes that we made was that we were full of idealism, but we weren't often very practical about how to accomplish our idealism. And then you had some of the subsequent generations that were less idealistic and a lot about me, and I think that didn't work terribly well either. I think young people today managed to really care about the world and how to make it better, but are rooted in a really pragmatic sense of yeah. how to get there or less ideological. And I I find that really impressive. You know, it's sort of almost de rigueur if you're middle-aged to say how awful young people are. We've been doing that for thousands of years. But in this case, I'm, I'm really pretty admiring of young people. Well, I... I want to be, and I, I think that I am. I think it's always good to be hopeful, yeah. uh, you know, for the next generation. Um, and to some degree, they might be a little bit more pragmatic. They might be a little bit more aware of, of some of these social issues. But then again, they also didn't vote. I mean, you know, they were the blo a voting block that, you know, demonstrably right. weren't showing up. Yeah. And so, you know, I say it with mixed enthusiasm because yeah. I'm not sure that they're quite there yet, but I think there's a lot of potential. Well, there's also a question about what our responsibilities are. For example, the, the, it's, uh, there, there's a fair amount of data that if a young person uh, enters a service program for a year to, say, city year, for example, that they do vote in higher proportions after that's over. Uh, and there are far more people who would like to be in service than we have positions for them. You know, that, and if you could have more young people who have that kind of experience being out and, you know, getting their hands dirty, you know, helping other people. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I, I really do. I think that that's, I mean, people have talked about, you know, maybe there should be a, a one year or two year service required mm -hmm. program. You know, that's something to talk about. It's, it's something, it's, it's a conversation we should have. Right, right. It would also and, help bridge this incredible class divide that we have in this country, yeah, where, yeah. which is increasingly calcifying. Yeah, it was interesting because you, when you hear, when you think about World War II generation, and what made it so democratic was that a salt and stall was was saluting some Polish kid from Brooklyn, right? And, and that made a big difference, right? That's and exactly I, right. Yeah. So, uh, well, I'm 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 really encouraged to hear what you say about that. Why do some leaders we look up to, and I'm thinking of Aung San Suu Kyi, why do they tumble? Why do they self destruct? Or at least apparently self -destruct, appear to self destruct. In Aung San Suu Kyi's case, I think that it was probably our collective misjudgment in part. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, I think, I'm not sure she changed all that much, but you know, she, she was tremendously brave in the way she stood up to the regime in Myanmar. Um, and I think we saw that courage and perceived that as this great Democrat standing up for democratic mm -hmm. rule. Um, 
I think to some degree she may have been a politician all along, and at that time when she was in opposition, that was the toolbox she had, was to stay in house arrest, refuse to leave the country, and, um, and write these very powerful uh, essays. But I'm not sure that she ever really was as much of a small d Democrat as we perceived. Mm -hmm. And in particular, that how inclusive she was mm -hmm. uh, toward the the Rohingya or to other elements of Burmese society, that she has been staggeringly myopic mm -hmm. about. And so, the fact that today you have a Nobel Peace Prize winner who, to some degree, is presiding over mass atrocities, uh, I mean, it's it's horrifying. To see, but I'm. Um, I, I think that the mistake may have been ours. I also think that she's mm. extremely um, uh, looking after her own interests. She's self-interested, right. and that means that there is just no way she's going to sacrifice, uh, uh, you know, her power and influence right now by and waste political capital by reaching out to the Rohingya. So I think that it's a calculus that she. Uh, it's a survival instinct. She is extremely good at surviving. And again, she's you know going back to her survival instinct that this is just not the right time. If she wants to stay in power, she's going to have to, you know, um, stand uh, where she's standing now. Hmm. Let me ask you about one final leadership question, the obvious one. Based on what we know so far, and this is obviously a very incomplete record, how do you think uh, Donald Trump may be shaping up in the minds of historians? Um, I think exceptionally poorly. I mean, I've always thought that as a model of horrible leadership who sends a country in the wrong direction, General Zia in Pakistan is emblematic, that he took a country that, where you had different groups that were kind of working together and to try to create a new national glue, he turned toward um, extremism and a more radical Islam in ways that have haunted Pakistan mm -hmm. for decades since his death. I'm afraid that President Trump has been systematically undermining institutions and mores uh, in ways that may uh, last uh, long, creating a divisiveness that may last long after he is gone. I don't think that, my, you know, my hunch is that his popularity will continue to, to fade. Uh, over the next few years, but I really do worry above all, not just about the decisions that he makes and the deregulation in the environmental world or the risk of awful foreign policy decisions, but the sense of undermining institutions, mm -hmm. uh, demonizing the press or the courts or the sense of referees we have in our society, the guardrails right. in politics. I think that's what I worry about the most. And I don't think historians will look back and reflect kindly on those kind of extra political steps that he's taken. Well, I think that those are the indelible uh, marks that he will leave because he will change society. Uh, he already is with the court system. I mean, that can be most the most pervasive and potentially damaging uh, to institutions, as you're saying, but also mm -hmm. to the society by installing a partisan politics into the court system. Uh, and, you know, also uh, on the environment, there are things that we can't bring back. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the redistricting, I think that he is really presiding over uh, something that could be extremely damaging to uh, the institutions and to the country. Do you, do you think there's a possibility that instead of leaving, uh, leaving a country that's divided for, for many years, um, that you could have a backlash against a backlash, in effect, that you could have a rallying and coalition develop that rejects what's happening now and, and is, is uh, more unifying? Is that possible? Is there, yeah, is so, there a good outcome like that possible? Well, I think that um, there certainly could be, but there are some decisions he's taking now that will just last for, for, mm -hmm. for a long time, such as in the court system. Right. I think that and then the redistricting will take mm -hmm. a long time yeah. to undo. Yeah. And they've stacked the cards against, um, mm -hmm. you know, 
you know, it's it's really stacked in favor of the Republicans. So those are kinds of decisions that are hard to undo right away, even with the backlash. Right. But it's, cultural norms, can they change? Do you, do you think that truth will be sort of become a, a, a dismissive, people be dismissive of the whole idea of truth and facts and, you know, and that that will stick with us? Well, so, uh, I mean, I, I think there are a couple of elements with this backlash against the backlash right. that we're yeah. seeing that are promising, at least in those areas. And one is on women's rights. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the not so much the Women's March, but especially the Me Too efforts, the reporting right. on sexual uh, predation, I think that this has begun to create some accountability, some end to impunity, in ways that will probably last and mm -hmm. will make workplaces less hostile for a lot of mm -hmm. women in a lot of places around the country, will at least generate progress in that direction. I mm -hmm. think that is partly a response to somebody uh, in the White House acting with complete impunity on these fronts. And another area where I think there has been some progress is, frankly, in the media mm -hmm. world. Um, you know, at the New York Times, uh, uh, before the election in 2016, there was some nervousness that we had done so well in 2016 with subscriptions, with uh, audience, and then we figured, okay, Hillary Clinton's going to be elected and nobody's going to bother to read the New York Times anymore. And that problem was solved by Trump's election. <laughs> um, and he... So the Times is no longer failing. <laughs> he, yeah, I mean, he helped give us a business model. He helped give so many other news organizations a business model. He revived the sense of mission mm -hmm. for so many news organizations. And I, it's certainly true that he has helped create a narrative of fake news, of distrust for mainstream news organizations, and I think that is an enormous national problem, that we have this, uh, this splintering, uh, fragmentation of news sources, but it's really important that he helped create a business model, helped create recognition of the importance of reporting. And, you know, before the election, there was a lot of talk about how BuzzFeed was going to be the future of news. Mm -hmm. Nobody says that now. Hmm. But That's I also think there, there it, he is exposing fault lines, which is really important, in the same way that the Harvey Weinstein uh, incident did actually allow some of these issues to surface and bubble to the top. Uh, and that's why we're seeing the ripple effects, you know, in companies trying to implement, you know, better sexual harassment policies. I mean, I do think that uh, the Trump administration is exposing some of the faults, which allows other people to say, hey, mm -hmm. may maybe I can actually... Uh, help out here. Maybe I can play a role. And so this is the backlash that you're talking about, right. that there are, it's bringing more people uh, into into the fold, into the political tent, or at least to consider uh, politics right. more seriously, which so is, is great. The first, is the First Amendment better protected today than it was before he came into office? Um, sadly, I'm, I don't think I would Go that far. quite say that. Yeah. I I think there's more vigilance on mm -hmm. many fronts. I mean, President Obama was not great for press freedom, but people tended to trust him maybe a little bit too much on that front. Mm -hmm. and while there's this deep distrust of President Trump and hence more vigilance over his actions, um, but I, you know, I am nervous about steps that he could take. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, not, you know, I. I don't think he's going to try to close a newspaper down, but using economic steps to yeah. against news organizations, this kind of thing, uh, I, mm -hmm. I do worry about that to some degree. Interesting. Well, trust in the press did increase after Watergate. Yeah, people, That's right. People thought it was important. It was a watchdog. It, it turned out to be right. Yeah. That's right. And it, and it was interesting. And it brought into the yeah. press some young people like me. Right. Uh, <laughs> my generation of reporters went into journalism in part because of Watergate, because we saw this is an important way to have an impact on That's the world. That's fairly interesting. Well, maybe people will get into politics, too, the same way, the younger generation. It certainly seems to be happening. Yeah. It yeah. does look as if 2018 will bring a lot of, you know, really new important, strong yeah. new, new, new players. Yeah, good. I, I would love to go on, but you all have been very generous with your time. Your, your students here at Harvard have loved having you on campus, and thank you for being part of the Hauser uh, Fellowship Program. We welcome you back anytime, and I just, it's just it, you, you, you brought that voice of conscience here that is really important for everyone. Thank, thank you, you both. David. Thank you, okay. David. It's been great. Thank you, and thank you all for listening.